So I have the idea of a vector as a way of coupling together our different spatial dimensions so we can keep track of uh, motion in, in those different dimensions. Um, what do we do with vectors? Well, one of the first things you might want to do is uh, do arithmetic with them. Use them as mathematical objects, just like you would with numbers. Um, the first step into this, we're going to talk about the graphical picture for what does it mean to add two vectors together. And for right now, let's just imagine that these are just your own motion. I want to walk along the vector A for some distance in that direction. And then the next thing that I want to do is move along the vector B along its direction for its length. And then I'm at a new position. And what is that new position? Well, that's the same as A plus B. So we want to learn how to do vector addition. Okay, And as we're going to be doing this, uh, doing arithmetic with vectors, um, we are in a simplified case where we can always just pick up a vector. And as long as we don't change its length and we don't change the direction that it points in space, we can translate it. We can put it anywhere that we want. Okay. And just as if we want to move along A and then move along B, that suggests we want to take the tail of vector B and put it at the head of vector A. Therefore, we have added A to B. Okay, So for addition of vectors, two or more vectors, just line them all up, head to tail, head to tail, head to tail. And then the sum of them is the vector that goes from the tail of the very first vector in the sum all the way to the head of the last vector in the sum. All right, so let's expand on that sum. To add vectors together, you put the tail of the second vector at the head of the first, and it is perfectly legal for you to move around vectors as you wish, as long as you don't change their length and you don't change their direction. Uh, if you were in a curved space, then you can't do that, or at least you need to be more careful about how you do that, what it means to transport a vector parallel to itself. Uh, but we don't have to worry about that. Uh, this is just physics P221. And so all we have to do is just put the tail of the second vector at the head of the first. And then their resultant, uh, what you get from adding A and B, is a vector S that's going to go from the tail of the first vector in the sum all the way to the head of the last vector in the sum. All right. Now you might be concerned because I said the first, the second, or the first and the last. Uh, for addition, it doesn't matter which one you call first and which one you call second because vector addition commutes. So I get the same answer S whether I added A plus B or I did B plus A. And you can quickly verify that for yourself. I imagine going A and then B. I wind up at the same place as, as if I did B first and then A. It's the very same vector. So vector addition commutes. And it might be useful to you sometime to have this idea of the parallelogram rule in the back of your mind for vector addition. So I imagine I have vector A and B that I want to add together. Uh, and those actually form a parallelogram because I have A and then a parallel transported copy of A. I have B and a parallel transported copy of B. And those four vectors together make a parallelogram. And then the sum is going to span across the parallelogram. Now, this is the graphical way of adding vectors together. Um, which is really good for an intuition. It's sort of a pain in the neck to do um, actual quantitative calculations with this. Uh, because to add vectors together graphically, we need to use a scale so that the length is meaningful for all of our vectors. And we need to measure angles with like a protractor. 
so we can have a meaningful direction. So if you actually want to get a quantitative answer out, certainly can, uh, but we would need to use the same scale uh, for all the vectors that we're drawing. Like, you know, a centimeter corresponds to uh, so much length of our vector, whatever our vector is quantifying. Um, and for this S, so we would lay out the vector A, we would lay out the vector B correctly in terms of length and direction, and then draw in the vector S, measure its length, so that's its magnitude, use a protractor and measure the angle that S makes, that's its direction. Um, so it'll be easier to do it with like a computer screen because every address on the screen is a pixel and you could, uh, at least at that level of precision, use the graphical method to add vectors fairly straightforward. It wouldn't be that hard to program, uh, but to do it manually on your own, um, this is the sort of thing you would do once and then probably never want to do again, but can do it. All right, so let's review a few ideas. Uh, I have two vectors, A and B. They're added together to form a new vector, C, and the magnitudes of these vectors are related as follows. So the magnitude of A plus the magnitude of B equals the magnitude of C. So which of those five statements has to be true uh, about those vectors A and B? If I can just add their magnitudes together, how uh, are those vectors related to each other? So think about it. Talk about it with your physics neighbors, and then when you are ready to go ahead to the answer, then you can unpause the video. All right, if the magnitudes of the vectors just add, it's like I'm moving along a number line. So those vectors have to be parallel to each other. They have to point in the same direction. If all of the magnitude of A plus all of the magnitude of B gives me all of the magnitude of C, then A and B have to be parallel to each other so that I'm not missing any of that distance by going off in a, in a different direction. So imagine if there were a slightly different direction for A than for B, um, I would wind up with a C that is shorter, okay? All right, let's try another one. So again, I'm adding vector A and B together to form a vector C. The relationship between the magnitudes of the vectors is given by A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So the Pythagorean theorem. Which one of the following statements concerning these vectors is true? So think about it, talk about it with your physics friends, and then when you're ready to go on to the answer together, uh, unpause the video. So this is uh, one of the more useful ideas with vectors and this gets at the heart of how we're actually going to use them in this class and in day to day. Um, if Pythagorean theorem holds for the magnitudes of the vectors, then A and B have to be perpendicular to each other. So you go along A and then in a perpendicular direction, you go along B. Adding those two together is going to give us the vector C. And if A and B are perpendicular, this is a right triangle, and the magnitude A squared plus magnitude B squared will manifestly have to be magnitude C squared. And this is how we're going to deal with vectors. If I have some vector C, we're going to imagine breaking it down into its orthogonal components. Uh, in two dimensions, C is going to have a part that lies along, say, the x direction, and a part that lies along the Y direction. And those components of the vector will be the representation of the vector in those coordinates. All right. A couple other things about uh, the addition of vectors. We've shown before that vector addition is commutative. It is also associative. And you can draw this out pretty easily for yourself and convince yourself that it's true. Just draw out three vectors, A, B, and C and convince yourself that I could add them as A plus B and then add to C. That gives me the same thing as if I added B plus C and then add that to A. So vector addition is also associative. Uh, and then for subtraction, um, we can 
think of that as adding a minus a vector. So what does minus a vector mean? That means it has the same magnitude, but I rotate it so it points in the opposite direction. So if this is the direction of A, then rotated 180 degrees in the plane, that's going to be the direction of minus A. And so when you come to a situation where you need to subtract one vector from another, think of that instead as adding minus that other vector. So A minus B, think of it as A plus the vector minus B. Add those two vectors together, uh, and then you have your uh, answer. So we've covered addition, we've covered subtraction. All right, what is the minimum number of vectors with unequal magnitudes whose vector sum can be zero? Think about it and talk it over with your physics friends. And when you're ready to go forward to the solution, uh, unpause the video, please. Since we were given the constraint that the vectors have unequal magnitudes, I need to have at least three of them. Uh, if, without that constraint, what's the minimum number of vectors that could sum to zero? It's two. I would have to go like A and minus A. I add those two together and I get zero. Uh, but if they have unequal magnitudes, then the smallest uh, number it could be is three. All right, addition of vectors. And the way that we're normally going to do this when it comes to using vectors in sort of everyday life, uh, we think about breaking a vector down in a particular coordinate system that we pick. And nature doesn't care about coordinates. Those are tools that we use. So we pick a coordinate system, hopefully one that makes the answer easy to work with. Uh, and in those coordinates, what are the components of a vector? And we want to do this because once we have broken down a vector into its components in a coordinate system, then all of the x components, say, will add together. You're just like moving along a number line. And in the same way, all of the y components will add together. And if it was a three-dimensional vector, you could do the same for the z components. Right. So I have some vector a. It exists. It is its own thing. And then we're going to ask, what are the components of that vector A in these chosen coordinates where X goes to the right and Y goes up the page? Okay. And obviously, if I pick a coordinate system that's rotated, then those components are going to be different. If I pick a coordinate system where the X axis is aligned with a vector A, then A only has one component. Still the same vector. Its representation is different in different coordinate systems. Uh, but all those coordinate systems are describing the same vector. It's a little weird to think about at first, but, but you'll get used to it. All right, so this vector A in this set of coordinates, where x to the right, y up the page, has two components. Um, I have a component along the x direction, which is A sub x, and then the perpendicular direction, the component along the y direction, A sub y, and I've put them here into a right triangle, but you could also think of them as what is the projection of A along the x-axis, and that gives us the adjacent side. What's the projection of A along the y-axis, and that gives us the opposite side. Okay. Uh, in terms of how to compute those components, how big they are, we use trigonometry. So the x component is going to be the length of the hypotenuse times cosine of theta. The y component is going to be the length of the hypotenuse times sine of theta. And the three sides of the right triangle satisfy the Pythagorean theorem. So the hypotenuse squared will equal the, opposite, the adjacent side squared plus the opposite side squared. So I can get to the length of the hypotenuse by taking the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. If it were a three-dimensional vector, then I would have a sub x squared plus a sub y squared plus a sub z squared. They're all handled equally, symmetrically. And if it were an n-dimensional vector, you just do the same thing. I would have n uh, terms in quadrature here under the radical sign. 
to get the angle theta, if that's unknown, uh, there's different ways I could do it. Uh, the way I sort of naturally think of it is I am going to take uh, tangent of theta is the ratio of the opposite side to the adjacent side, but obviously you can get it from adjacent hypotenuse if I use cosine or opposite and hypotenuse using sine. So basically I have a trig function. Theta would be the arc tangent of the y component of the x component. And you just need to, perhaps depending upon how your calculator functions, uh, you need to be cognizant of which quadrant you're lying in uh, for your answer. Um, some calculators will use uh, a two argument tangent, inverse tangent function to keep track. The calculator will keep track of which quadrant you're in. If uh, you can only take the arc tangent of a single number, um, then you need to be a little bit more careful and think about what you're doing uh, because this ratio could be positive in two quad quadrant quadrants, and it's negative in two quadrants. Thus, you need to keep track of where you're at. Always a good idea to draw out a picture. All right, so let's try out a little example problem, breaking a vector down into a component, so a projection along an axis. Uh, so this is a sports ball question. So breaking several tackles, a football player carries the ball uh, for a distance of 33 yards in the direction 76 degrees north of east. So the way the field is aligned to determine the number of yards gained on the play, find the northward component of the ball's displacement. Is the northward component of the ball's displacement 8 yards, 16 yards, 24 yards, 28 yards, 32 yards? And I apologize for not using MKS. Uh, football uses yards and not meters. To so work that out, check your answer with neighbors, and then uh, when you're ready uh, to go over your work, unpause the video and see how you did. All right. So the answer is 32 yards. Let me try to scratch out how we got there. Um, okay, so somebody ran the ball 33 yards, direction 76 degrees north of east. So there's the vector representing their run. And that has a component along the east direction and then a longer component along the north direction. And I've made a right triangle because no part of east points along north, for example. So I can think of this as being like my x-axis and north being my y-axis, right? And then this angle is 76 degrees. So to find the northward component out of that run, I'm asking for what is basically, I'll call it A sub Y. It's going to be the length of the hypotenuse, which we are given 33 yards. Blink, so 33. And I want the northward component, uh, so that is going to be coming from the sine of 76 degrees, right? Because I'm wanting this opposite side. Opposite over hypotenuse is sine of 76. So the opposite side is the hypotenuse times the sine of 76 degrees. Okay. All right. And if your calculator is correctly in degrees or an angle in degrees, um, that should work out to two two digits being 32 yards.
uh, which sort of matches our intuition of this drawing. It's close to 90 degrees. So the run we're at, you know, 90 degrees north of east, that's I'm going to just ran due north. And so all of your displacement is going to be the northward component. This is not quite that. So it's a little bit shorter than 33 yards, and it looks out to be 32 yards to two digits. All right. Right. The notation that's used in your book is a little different than uh, in other physics textbooks. So I just want to go through it um, to help and make you familiar with it here. Uh, you might have used in a math class that I write out a vector in terms of parentheses and the different components are separated by commas. Um, it's actually that's not that useful in physics for, for other reasons. We tend not to write uh, vectors that way. We would write them in terms of how far you go along a unit vector. Uh, and we use the unit vectors to essentially label what the components are. That takes a scalar and makes it into a vector that then has a direction that it points. So uh, if I wanted to describe some point in space that was two meters along my x direction for that coordinate system three meters along the y direction and then five meters along the z direction and write that position out as a vector so that the head is at that point in space and the tail is at the origin the way your book would express that idea is a position vector r is the x component times the unit vector i hat plus the y component three meters times the unit vector j hat and then Lastly, five meters this is the z component, and then the unit vector along the z direction is k hat. So a unit vector, as the name implies, it has unit length. So the length of the unit vector is one. So multiplying by the unit vector doesn't change the direction or the magnitude of that component. And i hat is always parallel to the x-axis for some coordinate system. J hat is always parallel to the y axis and Z hat uh, or K hat is always parallel to the Z axis. All right, so then why doesn't your book use X hat, Y hat, Z hat, which arguably might be more straightforward. Um, it is, you know, if you think about it in part because uh, you don't wanna confuse X hat as being the variable X. And you don't want y hat to be confused with being the variable y and so forth. So the unit vectors that we use are i hat, j hat, k hat, our unit vectors that respectively point in the x, y, and z directions. 